What we're going to talk about today, which is probably, hopefully you're in the right room in the right place on the right day, is we're going to talk about this kind of new focus of the state and really wanting to highlight the importance of having hands-on active learning as a key component of our kindergarten curriculum. So I'm going to talk about a play-based uh, kindergarten, but I really want to talk about this focus on the second hand uh, part of this title, which is the hands-on active learning. So we're really going to focus on what that means and how that relates to play-based kindergarten. Okay. So before we even get started, we are in a room of a lot of experts. So what I want you to do is we're going to just do like a five little minute pair share so you can pair up with somebody near you. And I just want you to take a second to think about what do you like to teach? So what is your favorite activity to teach or lesson to teach your kids every year? The one that you're like, I cannot wait till that part of the year comes. Uh, or what experience do you think your students enjoy most that you pr provide for them? And also, what lessons do you think best help support your students' learning? Mm -hmm. All right, so I was sad to have to stop that conversation because it seemed like a lot was being shared. Does anybody want to share out one of the things that they talked about in their pair share? Be a brave soul. Yeah. Really the open-ended things that we give them. We give them kind of like a task or a challenge or something, and they're allowed to do it without us knowing the answer, per se. Those are the things that they I think, always remember the best. Yeah, so open-ended kind of con like discovery kind of experiences where they can kind of figure it out on their own. Yeah, anybody else? We talked about um, working on, lately working on nature play and bringing them outside. Mm -hmm. and what they get from that. So going outside and exploring the world around you, thinking about your place within the larger world and that learning doesn't even happen just within four walls, that it happens out there, right? I like data and I like research, so I'm going to throw some data at you. So we've been looking at, everybody knows, what does everybody know what the NAEP data is for third grade and eighth grade? These are the markers of how well our students are doing internationally and in comparison towards uh, in reading and in mathematics. <coughs> well, we see that in the United States, actually our kids in third grade are pretty comparable to the world around us. But then some reason at eighth grade, we start to lag behind. And the reason for that is actually that content knowledge, that just general understanding of how the world works is really the thing that's stopping our kids from excelling. We're really good at teaching phonics. We're really good at teaching grammar, but we don't give them enough to be good comprehenders of the world. So you have to, you know, as when we write a story, there's a lot of information that's in that text that we just assume that our reader already has. And so there's a real need for that the skills that the kids bring to our classrooms, the knowledge that we bring to them. And as kindergarten teachers, you are usually their first time ever being in a, a classroom setting. And it is odd. Being one of 20 in a classroom where you've got just two adults that are, you have 25, where you've got everybody divided, having to divide their attention, like I want now, and you're telling me I have to wait? I have to wait, raise my hand? That's hard. So you've got these little kiddos that are coming to the world with a host of expectation about how the world works, where I've got my mom and dad and they're gonna give me their undivided attention. And then you're having to navigate that with your kids are coming to the classroom with vastly different levels of basic content knowledge. So what they're bringing to you looks a lot different in kindergarten than it is when they're coming to third grade. So it's a really good point. And so one of the things we need to think about as teachers is yes, we wanna focus on phonics, we want to focus on you know, teaching number sense, but a lot of also what we want to focus on teaching is an understanding of how the world works. So going outside and playing and being able to explore the world so that I can understand that these are things that are alive. Plants are alive. I saw that plant grow. You know, viruses are not alive, but I can't see a virus, so it's really hard to understand that viruses aren't alive. But it's something that getting them out in the world where it's tangible. Doing the hands-on construction. That's a way for me to figure out how things relate to each other. This didn't work when I did this. I'm doing float and sink, and I thought that rock because it was big and round, like my ball was gonna float, and then all of a sudden it sinks to the bottom of my water table. I'm constructing that knowledge. I'm understanding how things relate to each other. And so it's all those things that work together. And as a kindergarten teacher, you're in a very unique position to think about how, what do they know coming in? 
what is their experiences coming in and how do I create an environment that's odd take this odd environment and make it something where they can feel comfortable and they can thrive and they can learn make sense so that's what we're going to talk about today is all those kinds of things okay so then just one other question I'm not going to have you guys talk to each other about this but just answer this to yourself how much do you think your current classroom provides opportunities for exploration, for movement, for expression, and for play. And I lifted these words from the document that was sent out from the Department of Education. So they said that there's four principles they want us to think about improving, or uh, that the law is meant for us to support as teachers. Exploration, movement, expression, and play. So these are the things that they have taken the step to do to say we want to elevate these things so think about this how much is this happening and would you like this to be happening more in your classroom than it currently is so let's just do a show of hands how many people would like to see these things happening more in their classrooms pretty much everyone I would I teach undergraduates and I need more of this I, need to, I am constantly racking my brain how can I give them a hands-on activity where they can work together to create something and not just me passively lecturing at them because I like the sound of my own voice to some extent but uh, the Midwestern twang sometimes shows up so I want to give other people time to talk. So with that in mind then let's just take a step to start us all on the same foundation and talk about this substantive educational content of an adequate education law. The subset that's important to us that's um, come out is the RSA 193-E colon 2-A and this three lines of text or three sentences of text so the first text of this law says we want instruction in support of kindergarten standards that shall be engaging and shall foster students development and learning in all domains including physical social cognitive and language so what this is saying is the law is now highlighting the importance of saying comprehensive development. That development isn't just math and, and language and literacy skills. That it's beyond just academics. That we need to focus on supporting social and emotional development. Kids have to learn to be able to cooperate. They have to learn to be able to get along in this very foreign environment of two adults to 14 kids in some cases, right? So, and we also want to think about it, it's also our physical development. It's getting outside and running around because we need to work on gross motor development. And so it's all that thing. So it's highlighting that we, as, as a state, think it's important that we're developing all components of our kids' development. And not one component circumvents the other. That they're intricately intertwined. I can't be a good learner if I'm not a good friend. I can't learn what you're teaching me if I can't sit still and allow my friends to take in the information. So that not one thing trumps anything. We need to think about comprehensive development. Okay. The second line is ed educators shall create a learning environment that facilitates high quality child directed experiences based upon early childhood best teaching practices and play based learning that comprises movement, creative expression, exploration, socialization, and so the big idea here is we want high quality child directed experiences that are best that are based on best practice this is the one that becomes hard we all say we know we want to support kids fine motor development we all know we want to support their social skills and their collaboration skills but how do we do it it's not just what we want kids to know it's how do we want them to know it and so this is as somebody who studies this and researches this i'm going to tell you we don't know all the answers I can't say, here, let me pull this curriculum off the shelf and hand it to you, and this is going to work for you. The thing about teaching is it is an artistry. You create an environment that's a fit between you and your student. You know what your student's bringing to the table, and you adapt your practice and the things that you feel really strong about and the things that you enjoy doing, and you work together. So, but we do know that there are certain general things that I can tell you that if teachers who do more of X have kids that learn more. So one thing I can tell you from my own research is that if kid classrooms, these are pre-K classrooms that I study, not kindergarten, but pre-K, but pre-K classrooms that spend more time in child-directed instruction, so this is center-based instruction, 
compared to classrooms who did less of that, those classrooms that did more center time had kids that made larger gains in reading and in math and in self-regulation skills. So that's like one of those things I can tell you. We do know that time and time again we study this process. And the more opportunities to provide kids to direct their own learning and do the exploration and to do the time with manipulatives, the better they are. They learn more. So there are general things we know. I'm going to talk a lot today about those general things related to play that we know that when you create an authentic, hands-on learning experience that that shows that kids learn more. But in terms of what you specifically want to do, there's not really a manual for that. This requires you to test things out. It requires you to be a teacher as a researcher to say what works best for my kids. Now we've got lots of guidelines. NACI is a wonderful tool. The National Association for the Education of Young Children has wonderful tools for us to think about this. But when we think about what we do best, it is always a process of trying to balance what we know works for us. So take strength and take some um, resolve in the fact that you're going to be working hard to figure out what is the, creating the best environments for your students. And I'm going to encourage you to think very, you know, think very critically about, does this work for me? Am I getting the outcome that I want with my students? Do I see them making the, the growth that I want? And then the last line of the law that we just should highlight is that educators shall develop literacy through guided reading. So there is academic standards. We're going to focus on guided reading to teach early reading skills. And they shall provide also, in addition to that direct literacy or that guided literacy instruction, we need to provide time for unstructured discovery. So we need free time that allows kids to develop for, uh, for discovery of each child's individual talents, abilities, and needs. So this actually highlights two important pieces that we know are important for supporting kids' development in uh, early childhood. We want them to develop their kind of developmental skills, like I can get along with other people, I can sit and pay attention, I can have conversations, those kind of developmental skills to be kind of engaged with the world around me. But then there's also academic skills, right? So teaching you that the A makes the off sound or the A sound, right? So teaching the fundamentals. And it's a balance between those two things constantly, right? It's academic skills and it's the developmental skills. But this is really kind of highlighting both of those. Unstructured time for developmental skills of talents, abilities, and needs, and then it's also that kind of more structured academic. 